Hello everybody. I'm Miss Trish. I'm one of the RE teachers for UU St. Petersburg and I'm here with the lesson for August the 16th and this lesson was written for the Unicorns group and it's called Journey of Justice and I will light our chalice to start this service. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. So, hmm, journey of justice. We speak out for justice in many ways. One way we do this is to take a journey called a march or a protest. And we walk together or roll together or move together in various ways to move forward towards justice. So our spiritual focus this week is the practice of witnessing in a group, if you've got a group or by yourself, if you're alone, witnessing and marching and protesting for what we think is right. These marches for justice are taking place all over the country right now as folks walk or roll or move somehow together towards something that they would like to be changed, like keeping immigrant families together, protesting gun violence, or helping people of color find justice. Being on a journey of justice means speaking out for fairness and kindness. Some people might hold a sign like this. It just says peace. We want peace. One protest sign you might see might say, Justice. Have you ever seen a protest or been on a march? If you have, what happened there? Unitarian Universalists have worked for justice in one way or another, and we've been together on marches or walks. We move as a group to let people know that we care about justice and we want something changed. But walking or marching isn't the only way to ask for change. You can also write letters to your congressmen or senators and tell them what you want. You can send your message to them in a card, even a valentine. Women did not always have the right to vote. And back when this country was being founded, the Declaration of Independence, which was signed in 1776, and the Constitution of the United States, which was approved by our Congress in 1787, did not even consider women's rights important enough to include. John Adams who later became the second president of the United States, was one of the men who worked hard to put together those documents to gain independence from Great Britain and to found our brand new country. His wife, Abigail, urged him to include women's rights. However, he did not do it. Our constitution that was approved still had women considering to be property of their husbands, much like slaves were considered to be property of their owners. In 1842, women who thought this was simply unsupportable sailed across the Atlantic with their husband on a journey to London where they met with various important people to discuss how we could end slavery. 
when they got there, these two women, Elizabeth, Katie, and Lucretia Mott were two of the women, and they went to the meeting, but they were not allowed to speak. In fact, if they even wanted to listen, they had to sit behind a curtain where no one could see them. Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Lucretia were shocked. How could men who wanted to end slavery deny women their right to speak? This was just wrong. And Elizabeth and Lucretia started working to obtain women's rights. It took several years before they got together their first big meeting. And in 1848, Lucretia and Elizabeth held a convention at Seneca Falls in New York to discuss women's rights. Now, they knew that they needed some kind of a written declaration. And so they wanted people to understand and they took the Declaration of Independence, which was written by men, and they used it as a guide. And the Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, they decided to write their own document and they called it the Declaration of Sentiments. And to advertise their two-day convention to discuss women's rights and talk about this new declaration, they put notices in the newspaper. Back then, most women were working hard on farms they didn't think very many women would be able to come to their meetings because they had so much work to do, cooking and cleaning and sewing clothes and keeping their men folk ready to work hard on the farms. So they were surprised when 300 women came to their convention. Some of them came on horseback or in wagons, some even walked. Forty men also showed up at the convention, and the women decided to let them in. Back in those days, if a man was present, it was considered proper to ask the man to be the head of the meeting. So Lucretia's husband, James, decided that he'd be the one that held the meeting. Elizabeth's husband, on the other hand, when he heard what she was up to, he decided to leave town. Many people, men and women, made speeches during this convention at Seneca Falls. When Elizabeth made her speech describing the Declaration of Sentiments that she and the other women had written, she listed all of the laws that were unfair to women. For example, women could not go to college or become doctors or lawyers or ministers. And I already told you that they couldn't have property and they couldn't keep their own money. Everyone agreed that that was not fair. But when Elizabeth Stanton Cady said that women deserved the right to vote, there was a lot of argument over that. In those days, most men and many women thought that women's vote was simply too daring to ask for. And of the 300 people that attended that convention, only 68 women signed the declaration and 32 of the men signed it. So that wasn't a lot. Elizabeth's father, when he heard what she was up to, rushed over to see if she had gone insane. Well, this made Elizabeth very angry, and she decided to start a revolution for women's rights. A lot of people thought she was insane. Ministers in the churches said things like, women belong at home, and newspaper re reporters, who were men, 
wrote things such as, a woman is nobody. Lawmakers thought that the idea of women voting was ridiculous, and they said things like, certainly women do not belong in the voting booths. Lawyers thought the idea was ridiculous, and they knew that it would be very hard for women to gain equality. But those women went for it anyway. A lot of newspapers wrote articles about that convention at Seneca Falls, and the word spread throughout the country, up and down the north, and all the way out to the Midwest, and a thousand women came to the first National Women's Rights Convention that was held in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850. And a very famous black woman who walked all over the country, her name was Sojourner Truth. She was an escaped slave. She went to that meeting in Ohio and people were shocked. She told them about how she was treated as a black woman and a slave. Sojourner Truth said, that man over there said that women need to be helped into carriage and lifted over ditches, and they have to have the best place everywhere. But nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud, mud puddles and nobody gives me the best place. And ain't I a woman? A 31-year-old school teacher named Susan B. Anthony heard about what was going on and decided to join forces with the women who were working for equal rights. She and Elizabeth traveled all over the country making speeches. Elizabeth had a family and it got to the point where she had to stay home and take care of them to bake and cook and wash clothes and take care of the children and her husband. But Susan was single, so she hit the lecture trail without Elizabeth. Soon, there was a big group of women that traveled around making speeches, and they became known as the Suffrage Express. Mary Lyons was one, and she opened up the very first female seminary where women studied science, mathematics, geography, rhetoric, which is the practice of arguing from both sides of a point, and they studied philosophy and astronomy and ancient and modern history. These were the same subjects that men studied in their colleges. Mary Lyons Seminary later became known as Mount Holyoke College, and it is still teaching women and others today. When women graduated from this college, however, they couldn't find jobs because nobody wanted to hire women. So, they founded their own hospitals and clinics for women and children. Antoinette Brown became a minister, and she preached in a church. Lucy Stone, who was a famous suffragist, broke the mold when she married Henry Blackwell. She refused to say the words in the wedding vow, Obey. She thought it wasn't fair that women would have to obey their husbands. And her husband Henry agreed to this before they got married. Also, he agreed that if Lucy wanted to keep her last name Stone and not change it to Blackwell, that she had the right to do this. And that's exactly what she did. The women working for equal rights became known as suffragists or suffragettes and they gave speeches no matter what the weather, in the snow, rain, hail, and even during blizzards. Many times, men showed up and they booed the women 
boo, or they mocked them saying, women can't vote, women can't vote, and mean things like that. Sometimes they even threw things at women. But the women continued and their hard work and dedication finally paid off when Massachusetts and New York finally let married women have property in their name and keep their own money. But lawmakers still refused to let women vote. When Civil War broke out in 1861 and the United States split, women served on both sides, doing many things, like some of them lived in tents on battlefields where they prepared food for the soldiers and nursed the wounded. And some women even dressed up as men and went into battle. Other women worked as spies. When President Lincoln issued the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, three million black people were liberated from slavery in the United States. But that wasn't all the slaves. Some slaves, some slaves lived in states that had broken away from the United States. And those states wanted to keep their slaves and they became known as the Confederacy, and they fought in the Civil War. But when that Civil War ended, the suffragists thought this might be a good time to take up their cause of women's vote again, and they started writing letters to get the vote for women. In 1865, Congress granted the right to vote to black men, but not to any women. So the women kept making speeches all over the country. Susan B. Anthony made 75 speeches at least every year for 45 years. That's a lot of speeches. And Sojourner Truth tried to vote in Battle Creek, Michigan but she was turned away. And when Susan B. Anthony tried to vote in the state of New York, she was arrested and fined, but she refused to pay the fine. Then finally, in 1869, about 80 years after the United States Constitution was ratified, the state of Wyoming finally granted women the right to vote. Yay! And then, right after that, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho followed suit. And then next, Washington, California, Arizona, and Oregon also granted women the right to vote. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony Lucy Stone and Lucretia and Sojourner Truth, they all got old and they died. But new women carried on the fight. And then 69 years after Elizabeth had written and talked about her Declaration of Sentiments and had that convention in Seneca Falls, there were still only nine states that were letting women vote. So they decided something had to change. They had to do something different to get results. So they staged a big parade in 1913, the day before President Woodrow Wilson took office. 8,000 women marched down the streets of Washington, D.C followed by 10 marching bands, four mounted brigades of soldiers, 10 floats, and three heralds that were shouting out the purpose of this parade, and six chariots. Wow. Angry spectators attacked the women 
and soldiers had to be called to protect them and save them from these attacks. Many people saw that and they did not like the way the women were being treated in these marches, even if they still didn't think women should be able to vote. In the next three years, four more states granted women the right to vote. And then in 1917, picketers started to march silently with their signs in front of the White House. Once again, angry mobs attached them, but this time no police came to help them. And they even arrested the protesters and took them to jail for marching. Some of them were given nothing to eat but bread and water and put all alone in solitary confinement. Other women were beaten. Still, suffragettes continued to picket in front of the White House. Newspapers wrote about the brutal treatment that these women received, and finally a judge ruled that it was unconstitutional to throw them in prison, and he ordered that they be freed. A whole year after the women started to picket the White House, President Wilson finally decided to publicly support them and an amendment to the Constitution giving women the right to vote in every state. So finally, after all their hard work on August the 26th, 1920, the 19th Amendment became law and women finally had the legal right to vote. It took 72 years of battling, but they won that right to vote. Yay! Even today, women are still working to change our society so that all women have equal opportunities. And not just women, but all people have equal opportunities. So... Let's do a quick meditation before we go to our activity. I'm going to get ready for that. So find yourself a place where you can lie down on your back and you won't disturb anybody and nobody will be disturbed by you. And I hope you've got that ready now if you don't pause the video and get ready because I'm going to start the meditation. I'll ring the chime three times. Listen while the sound disappears. Lying on your back, rest your hands beside your body and have your feet slightly apart and close your eyes. Breathe gently in through your nostrils and completely relax. Take your awareness to your right knee. Now your right thigh and your hip, moving up your body. Let your awareness rest on your right side. Take a breath in. Feel your leg and your side. Now take your awareness to your left knee, your left thigh, and your left hip. Bring it up to your left side. Take a breath in and out. Become aware of your right arm and your head. Feel your face. 
become aware of your left shoulder and your left arm. Take a breath. Now, become aware of your whole body. Feel your whole body and take a breath. With your eyes still closed, sit up. When you're ready, gently open your eyes. Now that your brain has had a break, it's ready to do some thinking. The idea for our activity is to make a sign for your own march or protest. So get your brain ready and think about what you would like to change in the world and what you want other people to think about. And maybe they can help you make the change. So to make your sign like my peace sign, we want a short message, maybe one word like peace, or vote, or maybe a sentence like, wear your mask to protect families, or maybe health care for all. You can use any of those ideas, or an idea that you have yourself. To make the sign, you're going to need some cardboard or craft paper, some markers, some tape, glue, something to hold your sign up, maybe a ruler or paint stirring stick, or maybe you want to make a sign for your front yard and you might need help from an adult to take an old coat hanger and make something you can stick into your lawn. When you're ready with your sign, you can take your team or your group, if you've got a group, and you go to a location where your sign will be seen. Maybe you wanna just march up and down in front of your home, or maybe you wanna to go to a park or a grocery store or maybe to the library and walk up and down with your group. If you're in the community, be sure to have your sign, your mask, and to be socially distanced from other people, to stay at least six feet away from them. And before you march, I want you to think, how do you feel about marching for this issue that you think is so important. Maybe it's freedom for the immigrants or justice or doing the right thing like wearing a mask in public. Do you feel nervous? Excited? Silly? Well, if you're nervous or even a little bit scared, you can think about yourself getting braver with every step you take. And this is something important that the world needs to know about. After you've done your march or put your sign in your front yard, take a minute to think about how you feel now. Sit quietly and then discuss it with your friends that went with you on the march or just think about it by yourself. It's important that we take action in the world. And I'm going to extinguish our chalice now. And as I extinguish this chalice, I want you to know that together we can make the world a better place for ourselves and for everyone else. I hope you have a wonderful week and I'll see you again next week. And I miss you. 
and I'm looking forward to the time when I can see you in person. Have a great week. Namaste.